Our next speaker is Philip Margaret. He's a PhD researcher at the University of Minnesota, and he will be presenting on some very intriguing groundwater modeling work for active drainage networks in Trout Brook, Minnesota. Hi, my name is Philip Marguerite. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities in the Water Resources Science Program. And I'm going to present um, our ongoing study investigating the impacts of active drainage networks and regional groundwater flow on flow and transport. So kind of give you some background. Um, there's a previous LCCMR study uh, that I worked on. It was titled Setting Realistic Nitrate BMP Goals in Southeastern Minnesota. Um, the objective of the study was to better understand when we will see the impacts of the implemented BMPs on nitrate pollution in Southeastern Minnesota. Um, within this study, we did modeling, age dating, and stream chemistry sampling. Uh, this would include things like nitrates and stable isotopes. Uh, three watersheds were modeled with ModFlow, Crystal Creek, Bridge Creek, and Trout Brook. And um, this current study builds on the previous LCCMR study um, using the Trout Brook model area. Um, you can kind of see on the graphic on the right-hand side, there's the three model areas um, uh, kind of blocked out with uh, Trout Brook being um, that upper model area in Dakota and Goodhue counties. Uh, some background for those of you guys who have not really studied much hydrogeology. So um, groundwater moves along flow paths in the subsurface. Uh, flow paths go from recharge locations to your discharge locations. Uh, which can be surface water features, springs, etc. cetera. Uh, flow paths range from local, intermediate, and regional. Uh, travel times or the time it takes for uh, the groundwater to travel from its recharge location to its discharge location are associated with each flow path. Uh, you can have shallow local flow paths, which are going to have shorter travel times and younger groundwater ages, or deeper regional flow paths with longer travel times and older groundwater ages. On the right-hand side, you can see a graphic here that kind of illustrates that. Um, the local flow paths are those green blobs with those kind of short and uh, pretty young um, groundwater ages associated with them. All these intermediate uh, systems are going to have those longer flow paths, a bit older groundwater ages. And these regional flow paths are that bottom kind of gray blob that's going to underlie uh, several local systems and some intermediate systems. And these are going to be longer um, flow paths and uh, older groundwater ages associated with them. Uh, some background on active drainage networks. Um, active drainage networks are referred or defined as the dynamic changes in stream networks in response to changes in hydrology through the expansion and contraction of a drainage network length as catchments wet or dry. Um, expansions are going to have channel networks becoming longer, smaller tributaries gain flowing water, while with contractions you get the converse, channel networks become shorter and smaller tributaries lose flowing water. In ADN theory, base flow is defined as the average groundwater seepage rate per unit channel length multiplied by the length of the ADN. And then on the right-hand side, again, you can see a graphic here. Um, on the left, you're going to see um, ADN expansion. Some of these uh, light blue channels gaining flowing water kind of coming active in uh, drainage network. And on the right-hand side is contraction, where you're seeing a lot of those smaller tributaries losing flowing water as the catchment dries out. Uh, kind of continuing on, ADNs represent the boundary condition for groundwater discharge into drainage networks. Uh, changes in ADN geometry can bring changes in groundwater flow path distributions and lengths. So if expansions, you get shorter groundwater flow paths, faster solute movement through the subsurface, increasing contributions of younger groundwater into streams, and increase in stream temperature. While in the converse with contraction, you get longer groundwater flow paths, slower solute movement through the subsurface, um, decreasing contribution of younger groundwater into streams and more therm thermally stable stream channels. Um, and again, kind of bring your attention to the right-hand graphic here. Um, on the right side, you can see the active drainage network at the, um, that time. And on the left-hand side, you can see the distribution of mean groundwater ages. So with the contractions at the top, you're seeing a lot um, more like longer or older groundwater ages. And then on the bottom, you're seeing uh, shorter travel times kind of associated with um, expansion, ADN expansion. Um, kind of getting into uh, the next part, DB model. So in 1877, the Boussinesque equation was derived using Darcy's law and the Tupot Forkheimer assumptions. So the two assumptions with that are that groundwater forms um, a free surface with atmospheric pressure and ignores the capillary effect above the water table. And groundwater flow is parallel to the underlying impermeable bed. Um, with the DB model, base flow increases with higher water table gradients, and base flow occurs as the water table drops until it falls to or below the stream. Um, in 1977, Brutzart and Ebert 
developed a well-adopted recession analysis method. Uh, the equation is um, dq over dt is equal to negative a q raised to the power of b, where a is a function of watershed characteristics and b is a function of aquifer geometry and the water table elevation profile, which defines early and late recession periods. Um, this DB model has been further expanded, including uh, things like variable saturated hydraulic conductivity, sloping aquifers, human groundwater withdrawals, seasonal effects, bedrock leakage, ADNs, and others. Um, on the right, you can kind of see the conceptual model of a DB method or DB model um, for base flow recession, where you have that uh, water table gradient kind of sloping up and it's going to fall um, in height until it reaches the bottom of the stream and then base flow is going to stop coming into the stream at that point. Um, some more background, multi-scale groundwater flow systems. Um, for those who are not aware of this term, it's groundwater flow systems of local, intermediate, and regional flow paths. Um, currently, it's not really addressed in basal recession theory. Uh, one recent study in 2022 has investigated the deep groundwater component in connection to basal recession. Um, in their study, groundwater flow systems became more controlled during prolonged drought by deep groundwater flow. And they kind of highlighted the need to account for local and intermediate scale groundwater flow and conceptual base flow models. You can kind of see on the left hand um, graphic here that orange is going to be that deep old groundwater and that blue is going to be that young um, shallow groundwater. And as this drought kind of progressed, you see that orange deeper older groundwater kind of controlling the system um, until it kind of becomes the most dominant um, groundwater in the system at the end of the drought that they simulated. So the project summary, um, what we are doing in this project is investigating the impacts of ADNs and regional groundwater flow and headwater stream catchments with multi-scale gr uh, groundwater flow systems. In our case, this is Troutbrook. Um, the hypothesis of the study is that regional groundwater flow and ADN dynamics have a substantial impact in catchments of multi-scale groundwater flow systems during long-term changes in hydrology while having a measurable but not dramatic impact during short-term seasonal or event-based changes in hydrology. Um, the objectives of the study are number one, to investigate the impact of regional groundwater contributions and ADN dynamics on base flow recession and catchments of multi scale groundwater flow systems, i.e., trout brook, and then investigate the ADN dynamics and multi scale aquifer contributions on solute and heat transport and mean groundwater age within catchments of multi scale groundwater flow systems. Um, some background on uh, the methodology. So, we are using ModFlow, ModPath, and MT3DMS for modeling tools. Uh, field monitoring is going to also be conducted in Troutbrook, which is going to include stable isotope sampling, chloride, flow, and temperature. And field data will be used to calibrate and validate the models, as well as discover local trends not captured by the regional models. On the right, you can kind of see a graphic of our current iteration of the Troutbrook model. Um, that blue is going to be the higher hydraulic head, and that red's going to be the lower. So you can kind of see in uh, the Troutbrook system, you're having groundwater kind of flow uh, south of the northern saddle and north of the southern saddle down towards the Cannon River. Trout Brook is going to be that stream network on the right, that large stream network kind of reaching back into the saddle there. Um, background on mod flow, um, for those of you guys have not are not very um, familiar with it, it is a modular finite difference flow model. It is a commonly used groundwater flow model um, in the hydrogeology field. And it can be used for building both local and regional scale models. And it is developed by the United States Geological Survey. Um, oops, sorry. And then on the right hand side, you can see a conceptual model again for mod flow. That uh, blue head, or the blue is going to be the higher hydraulic head. And then the red's the lower one. You kind of see where the flow is going to be going from that top left, top right, down to the um, bottom center. Uh, mod path. Um, this is an integrated particle tracking model. Um, it uses the output from mod flow to compute flow paths. It's used for computing flow paths to specific locations in the model. It produces results for travel times and distances for these computed flow paths. And it's used to find capture zones for specific wells, contributing areas and aquifers for specific discharge points, uh, mean travel times for specific locations, et cetera. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can kind of see a graphic of an example output from mod path. This is going to be a cross section of a subsurface. You can kind of see the um, flow paths that I've kind of referenced previously. These local ones are going to be those smaller concentric circles at the top. Those intermediate flow paths will be that kind of middle, medium sized con uh, concentric circles. And those regional ones are going to be that really deep, long uh, flow paths at the bottom. Uh, kind of moving on to MT3DMS, um, it is an integrated solute and heat transport model. 
It uses the flow field output from mod flow. Uh, this handles advection, dispersion, and chemical reactions and contaminants in groundwater flow systems. And it is used for solute and heat transport modeling with produced mod flow models. Um, I'm going to write a graphic kind of showing you an example of what MT3DMS kind of outputs. Uh, they put pollution in that um, kind of magenta polygon, and then they simulated the plume of pollution using that uh, mod flow um, outputted flow field to kind of show how far that pollution is going to move. So what goes into these modeling tools? Um, hydrogeologic data, number one. So we use strata elevation data. Uh, mainly, we use the county geologic atlas rasters and borehole data. Uh, hydrogeologic properties, things like KV, um, hydraulic conductivities, porosities, et cetera. Um, regional flow conditions. So uh, regional groundwater contours are needed to set boundary conditions um, for the outer boundaries of a model to allow it to be an open system. Um, well data, so hydraulic head values and pumping rates, we mainly get these from the county well index in Minnesota and the MPARS data set for high capacity pump wells. Um, surface water data, so flow and water levels, topology, chemistry, et cetera. Climate data, so things like recharge rates, ET, precip, et cetera. And then chemistry data, so chem uh, chemical loading and concentrations. Um, on the right-hand side, you can kind of see a graphic of the different um, calibration wells we've used in our Troutbrook model to calibrate it to a uh, hydraulic head. Um, these wells were mainly grabbed from the Cooperative Groundwater Monitoring Network um, ran by the MNDNR and the Minis um, County Well Index ran by the MDH. And you kind of see they're pretty well spatially dispersed throughout the model. So how do we calibrate and validate these models? Um, we use uh, PEST, which is a nonlinear parameter estimation software. Um, PEST history, history matches simulated versus observed conditions, and it provides this understanding of how far off you are from observed conditions and the sensitivity of parameters. On the right, you can kind of see a graphic of what PEST does. So um, the, top, uh, the Y axis is calculated head or simulated by the model. The X axis is observed head um, or field measured head. And PEST will calculate how far off your calculated is from your observed and give you a residual value, which is used then to kind of calculate your error or how far off your model is from what the conditions are measured in the field. Um, additionally, you can use comparative analysis um, to field data. So this is things like um, that we've used in the past, such as groundwater age, uh, chemical loading and concentrations, and strata placement slash thickness. But when you do do comparative analysis, you do have to consider scale as field data will be at a much finer resolution and scale than modeling data as their models are usually at a resolution of a couple hundred meters by a couple hundred meters per cell. So there's gonna be a scale difference and you do have to take that into account when you do compare uh, simulated um, results from your model versus field measured data. So getting into the Troutbrook model, um, this is located in both Dakota and Goodhue counties in Minnesota. It is a five-layer model. The materials modeled are till, alluvium, St. Peter sandstone, uh, the Shockby Formation, Oneota Dolomite, and Jordan sandstone. It's approximately 375 square kilometers. You can kind of see on the map right here, this is the map of the model area. You have Lake Billsby on the left. You have Cannon Falls kind of next to it, and then you have Trout Brook. Um, in this upper area near where Douglas is, um, kind of on that right-hand side. So getting into the base flow recession modeling, we'll be doing it for Trout Brook uh, model. So base flow recession modeling will be uh, use transit simulations. Um, pumping wells will be turned off to exclude their impacts. We're going to simulate the drought by turning off a recharge flux. Um, drought simulations will be run until Trout Brook goes dry. These are going to be used to assess for changes in base flow, mean groundwater age, fraction of regional versus local groundwater flow, and ADN length. Um, in this study, we will also develop a simplified version of a metro model, which was originally created by the Twin Cities Met Council for the Twin Cities metropolitan area. This is going to be used to obtain a decay rate for uh, regional head in the aquifer system of Troutbrook. To then, um, and then this decay rate is going to be applied to the outer boundaries of Troutbrook to kind of simulate that decay of inflow from these regional aquifers outside of the Troutbrook area into the model area. Uh, the re recession analysis is gonna be done using Broussard and Eber's methodology. Um, it's gonna be done using a plot of negative DQ over DT versus Q values on a log log plot. You can kind of see that on the right-hand side, an example of this. Um, the slope of the plot represents the B value. A B value between one and two is expected for late stage recession. Again, you can kind of see on the graph there 
um, that lower slope of B equals uh, three and three over two, that's going to be um, kind of what's expected for late stage recession. Um, a B value outside of this range indicates that the DB model is invalid. And then we expect to see that the B, uh, B value for late stage recession during our uh, drought simulations in Troutbrook will go to positive infinity as a change in discharge goes to zero um, due to the regional groundwater flow in the model. Uh, kind of getting into the solute and heat transport modeling. So these are going to be conducted with steady state transient simulations. Uh, steady state scenarios are going to be um, number one, changes in recharge. So we're going to increase or decrease the recharge flux um, by 10% intervals, up to 50% change from the original value. And then changes in groundwater pumping. So it's going to be increases or decreases in groundwater pumping rates, again, by 10% intervals, up to 100% change from the original values. Um, ModPath and MT3DMS simulations will be run during each scenario, and then these results are going to be used to investigate changes in mean groundwater age, fractions of uh, regional versus local groundwater flow, and heat and solute transport. Uh, we're also going to be doing transient simulations. Um, these are going to be used to investigate how important these changes are, i.e. if we have a one-hour storm, how substantial are these components, what is the outcome, how, they, how about one decade of drought. Um, so we're going to use a 10-year period of meteorological conditions based on historical data. Um, representative meteorological conditions for different realizations will be used. So things like uh, drought period, a wet period, a normal period. And the results will be used to investigate how dynamics of stream network and groundwater flow path distributions, impact flow and transport, and as well as how substantial these impacts really are um, using historical meteorological data. Uh, kind of getting back into the metro model, as I kind of um, previously stated. So we're developing a simplified two-layer metro model as well for this study. Um, the layers are going to be the upper aquifers as one layer and regional groundwater aquifers as a second layer. Um, we have this need for a decay rate for the heads of the outer boundary in the Troutbrook model to accurately represent long-term drought in Troutbrook. Um, so the simulated drops in the head um, from the metro model that um, simulations will be running will be uh, integrated in our outer model boundary for Troutbrook at discrete time intervals. Um, this is a novel methodology for long-term drought simulations, and it'll allow for a more accurate look at how the system will behave during long-term stress conditions. Uh, the simplified metro model will be used for the same solute transport simulations as well as a Troutbrook model, and this is also going to allow us to investigate um, ADN dynamics and regional groundwater flow. Um, and their impact on solute transport and heat transport on a larger regional scale in comparison to a catchment scale with trout, uh, the Troutbrook model. Um, expected modeling results. So um, for base flow recession, what we expect to see is regional groundwater will contribute a larger fraction of groundwater uh, to drainage networks during prolonged drought. We expect that the regional groundwater will play a larger role in base flow recession, sustaining base flow uh, substantially longer than the superficial aquifers. And we expect to see longer and older groundwater flow paths due to ADN contraction during drought periods. Uh, for objective two, um, for solute heat transport, we expect to see for long-term ADN uh, contraction, longer groundwater flow paths, a higher fraction of regional groundwater, uh, slower solute transport, and more thermally stable streams. During long-term ADN expansion, we expect to see shorter groundwater flow paths, a higher fraction of local groundwater flow, uh, faster solute transport, and warmer stream temperatures. Uh, for transient results, we expect that the wet and dry realizations will show an overall a significant change in flow and transport as compared to the realization of normal conditions. Uh, kind of get into the field campaign. So we're going to do a combination of continuous flow, chloride, stream temperature, and active drainage network length monitoring. Um, stream temp and ADN length monitoring will be accomplished with a pressure, uh, pressure transducer network continuously logging stream temp. Um, you kind of see on the right hand side a graphic of what a pressure transducer looks like um, for those of you guys who aren't very um, familiar with them. Um, in addition, we're going to be doing uh, stable isotope sampling for EMA analysis and these will be sampled monthly and following storm events. Uh, Emma analysis, it is a proxy for age tracer data. Um, this will allow for the field measurements of changes in the fraction of regional versus local groundwater flow, contributing to the total flow in the watershed. Um, with this, it'll be deuterium and O18 that are going to be collected. Um, the end members in this study are going, going to be regional groundwater, local groundwater, and runoff slash precip. Um, 
Emma analysis, um, for those of you guys who aren't very familiar with it. So you have these three equations. Uh, subscript one is runoff. Subscript two is regional groundwater. Subscript three is local groundwater. And subscript four is total stream flow. C1 is deuterium and C2 is O18. Um, we know the stable isotopic um, signature for regional groundwater and local groundwater based on historic data, as well as um, precip. Um, based on a regression uh, model. And then we will be collecting total stream flow by measuring that um, continuously, as well as stable isotopic composition of the stream flow um, at monthly and falling storm events. Um, using these five knowns, you can simultaneously solve these three equations to get the three unknowns that we're interested in, which are Q1, Q2, and Q3. This will let us figure out um, the fraction of total stream flow that is younger groundwater, as well as the fraction of total stream flow that is regional groundwater. And this will allow us to kind of um, measure in the field the changes of um, the two fractions of regional versus local groundwater um, at, again, monthly and falling five storm events throughout the study. Uh, for field work results, um, this is going to allow for the relation of changes in each parameter to changes in ADN length and the fraction of regional groundwater flow fall in seasonal or event-based um, changes in hydrology. So things like rainstorms, spring snowmelt, um, et cetera. This will also allow for the study of short-term impacts of ADN dynamics and regional groundwater flow on the system. This is going to allow for further validation as well of the decadal transient mod flow simulation with comparative analysis. Um, expected field results. So we expect to see that seasonal and event-based changes um, are going to be similar to our predicted modeling results for long-term events. Uh, we expect to see less dramatic but measurable impacts um, being observed in the field. We expect that seasonal and event-based changes are going to be similar to our transient simulation results. And we anticipate observed impacts in the field will recede following event-based changes and follow general hydrologic trends associated with seasonal uh, trends in hydrology. So kind of get into the impacts of the study. Um, first impact of the study uh, for solid heat transport is understanding uh, how significant these mechanisms are during long-term changes in hydrology, dry decades, wet decades, et cetera. So really kind of understanding um, how following things like a long dry decade, how this is going to, these mechanisms will impact solid transport and heat transport during that or conversely with wet decades. Um, and then understand how changes in hydrology of a stream, uh, things like climate change, increase in human groundwater um, extraction, et cetera, will impact transport and mean groundwater age. So in summary, um, results of this work will help us understand how significant these dynamics are for transport with changes in the water quantity of the systems in question, uh, whether that's human induced or weather induced. And then for baseload recession, um, number one, the first impact for the baseload recession aspects of this work is it's going to provide a better understanding of how watersheds with multi-scale groundwater flow systems behave in regards to baseload recession. Uh, number two, it provides a better understanding of the sustaining ability regional groundwater flow has in Trout Brook during prolonged stress conditions. And then number three, it provides a better understanding of regional groundwater flow in regards to base low recession theory. So in summary, um, most base low recession theory does not account for regional groundwater. It more so focuses on the local aquifers as kind of seen that DB conceptual model. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at the background benefit of regional groundwater flow on sustaining base flows of this study, which is something that's not really been done to the best of our knowledge outside of one study um, that we previously referenced, Wang et al., 2022. Um, lastly, accounting for regional groundwater flow is important, not only in understanding base flow recession dynamics in a watershed, but to understand the temperature and chemical characteristics of base flow in watersheds. Uh, this study will help contribute to a better understanding of the role that regional groundwater flow plays in both the water quality and drought survivability of watersheds of multi-scale groundwater flow systems. And then to give some acknowledgments to the people that are um, helping me work on the study, uh, I want to acknowledge my advisor, Dr. John Niebuhr, uh, my committee members, Dr. Joe Magner, Dr. Tony Runkle, Dr. Bruce Wilson, and Dr. Crystal Ning, um, as well as the MPCA, uh, DNR, and Dakota County Partners for Field Work Assistance, and MPCA, MGS, and Lake City DNR for contributing uh, field equipment for this project um, and kind of helping this project work. 
And then uh, here's some citations I've referenced throughout the uh, presentation um, and then kind of getting into questions now. Thank you for your presentation. I, there was a lot of content there. <laughs> you had to really fly through that. I think you probably could use a little bit longer time slot. Um, some questions have come in here. I want to make sure we get to those. It says, um, first one is asking if you continue the work on other watersheds, are you only looking in the Trout Brook watershed? Um, yeah, I, I can kind of answer that. Initially, we plan to continue this in Crystal Creek. Um, Right now we're very limited in funding, or at least I am. This is just a, this is my dissertation work. So um, I don't have the equipment or the funds to continue this in the other two watersheds right now. So we are kind of limiting it to Trout Brook um, for the field work component. Um, but if we did uh, get more funding, we would probably, or we would be um, more of an open to kind of continuing this in the other two watersheds that we worked in with uh, kind of the scope of that LCCMR study. Another question was, does the karst geology and the driftless result in leaky boundary conditions? Uh, yeah, I I guess to my best ability to answer that, uh, Bill, would be that I, I believe it would. But uh, Troutbrook, from my understanding, does not have the same karst conditions as you see kind of further down in the southeastern Minnesota uh, region. So I don't, in my understanding, believe it has as much of an impact in Troutbrook, but um, I can look into that more and get back to you on that if uh, you want. I can um, try to send you my contact information if you'd like. Yeah, that sounds good. I actually had a, a question kind of related, you know, how much you think the uh, modeling that you're doing in Trout Book would be, you know, similar for watersheds that had the similar geology, at least within the driftless area. Oh, I, I think it, when you're in that kind of incipient karst area, the modeling would be pretty comparable. Um, once you kind of get into that very developed car system, like you see in, uh, say, Crystal Creek and Bridge Creek, um, and I can kind of go back on slides a few, um, just to kind of show on the map. Uh, once you kind of get more towards like very southern Minnesota, Houston County, Fillmore County, where you have that really developed uh, car systems, um, I would say the modeling is going to be very different because those car systems down there will have a pretty dramatic impact on the travel times. Um because you do have a lot more developed cars and a lot more cars in those areas. So those bridge, bridge Creek model and Crystal Creek model, they do have much more cars features in the area that we'd have to account for that we don't have to account for in Troutbrook. Um, we do have plans to add those into those models in the future, um, specifically Crystal Creek. We do have plans to add in the cars features and do a bit of uh, more advanced modeling with it. Um, it just hasn't been finished as of today yet. Sure thing. Um, question came in from Doug Dieterman. Um, we have a habitat project going on um, <laughs> in Trout Brook this summer. Are you going to be able to assess if that project influences any floodplain groundwater flow effects? The project is intended to improve. It, I mean, that's going to be more of surface water connectivity to the floodplain, but um, I, I'm curious from your perspective with your knowledge base. Um, whether that's something you would see that level of resolution in your modeling. Uh, Doug, you, you should be able to. And um, again, if you want my contact information, I can kind of talk to you more about this because um, this might be a question that um, we might want to have a meeting on to kind of go into more detail. But um, you should see the flow paths changing a bit, at least those local ones changing. And you should see a bit of um, kind of older, more regional groundwater flow coming in to play. Um, when you have these kind of contractions or expansions um, or contractions and kind of converse on the expansions. Um, I may reference you to uh, Dr. Joe Magner. He did a lot of stable isotope work in the area um, and he might be able to answer that question in better detail than I can. Um, but I, I believe you should be able to see some influences on the um, kind of surface water groundwater connection um, in the field. At least that's what we're hoping to see with this study. Um, someone was hoping you could repeat the definition of, of ADN and expand on what that contraction looks like on the landscape. Yep. Uh, so ADNs are going to be that um, expansion or contraction of stream networks in response to changes in hydrology. So when you have expansions, you're going to see uh, some of these smaller uh, tributaries, some of these gullies, or um, just these smaller flow paths. Um, gaining water and becoming online in the stream network. So things like where you see a lot of these ephemeral channels um, after big rain events, 
kind of coming online for a couple of days in the stream network that you normally wouldn't see online outside of those larger rain events or conversely contractions. Um, again, you might see some of these smaller channels or ephemeral channels becoming dry. Uh, things like, you know, the summer of 2020, um, where you had that long-term drought where you saw a lot of uh, channels that maybe usually would have water in them, not having water in them. That's kind of what we're referring to with ABN contraction. And then there's another question from, from Bill Brandt. Uh, if your previously funded work uh, determined a reduction in nitrogen occurring in the groundwater flow and whether dissolved limestone or dolomite can act as a carbon source for nitrogen conversion. Yeah, uh, Bill, so that previous study, I should, um, I'll go back to it um, on that first page. So that previous study, what we did with that was more kind of geochronology work. We were trying to understand uh, the mean groundwater ages of discharging springs and points within the streams of question to understand when uh, the BMPs that are put in place in these watersheds are going to show up if they're working or not, or if we're working how we intend them to. This is kind of in line with the nitrate reduction goals set by the state of Minnesota. Um, we have pretty steep goals. I think it's, uh, I believe it's 45% by 2050 in the state of Minnesota um, of a reduction. And to be able to hit those goals, we need to know if the BMPs are actually working how we intend them to or working to the level that we need them to. So this study um, used these models basically to, with mod flow in conjunction with mod path to understand the travel times at different locations where you can sample at and understand where in these watersheds can we sample at to see the quickest um, result of these BMPs in the watersheds on nitrate reduction. So it wasn't as much... Um, like getting nitrate reduction in groundwater flow, it was more finding spots you could sample with modeling tools to then measure if the BMPs that they're implementing are actually reducing nitrate or not. Great explanation. Um, I think that might have captured uh, all the questions that we had in the chat. I guess I, one thing I was curious about um, for this type of modeling, there's a lot of inputs. Do you do you have a sense for the um, relative cost for a study like this if someone wanted to replicate these? <laughs> um, I think the LCCMR study was a couple hundred thousand dollars, but um, I think it was like 200. You can see the LCCMR grant because it's publicly available. Um, you can look up the title of it and then see what the actual grant cost was. Um, I should say a lot of that price tag did come from our field techs and the other experts that were on the study, as well as a couple other grad students and their funding. Um, so it was more than just the mod flow work on the study. Um, I also, um, I did the mod flow work. There's a couple other grad students doing other modeling, as well as uh, stabilized top work and uh, general just geochemistry work. Um, so I I would assume maybe 100-ish thousand, maybe more or less, depending on the size of the model. Um, but I, I probably couldn't answer as best as you probably would want me to here on what the exact cost would be. Sure. Well, really appreciate it, Philip. Thank you for reaching out <laughs> and and getting this presentation to us. It's been a really uh, useful for me knowledge yeah. in this groundwater modeling work. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it.